and we want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. We want to say a very special welcome to Castleberry, Castleberry ISD, and Central from Keller ISD. Teachers, if you are watching, you have not signed up, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash high school registration. Sign up for us, please, so we'll have a record of your attendance. Uh, the program this morning is going to be altered food change. During this virtual field trip, students will predict how the introduction or removal of an invasive species may alter the food chain and affect existing populations in an ecosystem, and predict how species extension may alter the food chain and affect existing populations in an ecosystem. Mr. Monroe will tell you all about barrel hogs in Texas. Mr. Dominguez is going to talk about pythons in Florida. I have a daughter that lives close to the Everglades, so that's a concern to me. And Ms. Schramm, removal of lionfish. And Ms. Ramirez is going to talk about species extinction. Students, you cannot ask us a verbal question during this program, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash question space answer and uh, send us in your questions and we'll be glad to answer them. And uh, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Mr. Monroe is going to tell you all about barrel hogs in Texas. Good morning, students. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're going to be looking at, oh, an organism that is considered to be an invasive species that is right here in Texas. In fact, I guess this one is considered to be the worst invasive species that our state, the state of Texas, has. But uh, before I go into any more detail, there's a short presentation that I want to present to you to kind of go over some things that will remind you of what it takes for an organism to become an invasive species. So bear with me while I share my screen with you. And we'll get that presentation started. You know, our state does have a lot of invasive species that are inhabiting our state, but there is one that is really wreaking havoc. Now, it is a species that usually is non-native to the, this area and causes harm to the local ecosystem. It can outcompete native species for resources and cause native species to go extinct or become endangered. It can cause economic damage through harming livestock, crops, personal property, and even water supply. They typically do not have a natural predator to keep their population in check, and they usually can repro reproduce very quickly. Well, that fits the bill for our feral pigs and our wild hogs. How many invasive species are there in Texas? I'll just give you a minute to glimpse. Boy, there's a bunch of plants, 67 terrestrial plants, 12 aquatic wetland plants, 10 mammals, four bird species, seven fish species, 11 insect species, and 11 mollusks and crustacean species. Wow. And they affect the Texas economy, which is dependent on industries that are affected by these species, agriculture, ranching, fishing, and mariculture. You can see the amount of money that is spent out or that we lose in those particular areas of our economy. There's a list of the worst of the worst, and this is the one that we're focusing on today with your part, my part of your virtual field trip. And that is uh, the organism that we call wild hogs. Here is a picture of a wild hog here. And let me give you just a little information about those wild hogs, because I tell you what, there are 254 counties in our state. 
99% of those counties have a population of wild hogs or feral pigs. Now, they go by different names, sometimes referred to as wild pigs, wild hogs, feral pigs, feral hogs, sometimes even referred to as a razorback, and sometimes referred to as boars, okay? They destroy land and crops and threaten other wildlife as they reproduce, the wild hogs reproduce at an alarming rate. Where do they come from? Well, started a long time ago, guys. In 1492, Columbus and other explorers were coming to the New World and they brought a, livestock, a lot of livestock with them. They brought pigs simply because pigs were easily, uh, they would easily adapt to the new environments that they were introduced into. And so they released a lot of livestock on the shores of the areas that they were exploring. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, in the 1930s, settlers or hunters or farmers brought in the European boars. And they brought these in simply because there was a sport for hunting them. Some of those did not get killed off, so they were released into the wild. And the ironic thing about that is the wild boars or the European boars began to breed with whatever hogs had turned feral that were already here. In 1980, they were kind of uncontrolled during the 80s. And then ranchers continued to breed pigs for hunting leases. And that's when the population began to grow. You know, the population of feral pigs can triple in one year. And wow, the crazy thing about it, if you don't remove at least 66% of that population each year, then you have no control over the population growth. And here in the state of Texas right now, currently, we're only removing 29% of that animal's population, which we're just putting a dent in, in well, we're just not, really affecting the population very much at all. You know, hunters, they hunt them, and that doesn't seem to keep them under control. Probably the most effective way, or the effective way that we're really knocking the population down is through trapping them. And, uh, you know, I've learned quite a few things about feral pigs because I was an avid hunter since I was a very young person. And I can remember in my home state during the 80s, I never saw a wild hog. It wasn't until I came to Texas. And of course, at that time, they were pretty well under control here. And now they're truly out of control. Trapping, seem, again, seems to be the most effective way to uh, keep the population down. And that's not really keeping the population. Even it was legalized that you could hunt them from helicopters. Now out here at the Environmental Ed Center, we do have a population of feral pigs or feral hogs or wild hogs, whichever you want to call them. And uh, the signs that they have been around is that, you know, feral pigs and wild hogs love to eat things that are subsurface, underneath the surface, like roots and things that may be on top of the ground, like insects. Uh, they also consume tubers. And the crazy thing about it, they are omnivorous. They love to eat plant life, especially sub plant life, but they also will consume baby calves. They will consume baby lambs and baby goats. Anything that they can possibly get, they are going to eat. So they are omnivores, okay? Now, listen guys, According to a Texas A&M study, Texas has a population of 1.5 million feral pigs or feral hogs existing in our state. In fact, Texas is the number one state in the United States in feral pig population. And that's because of the wide variety of topography that we have here. Our state is a very large state. And these guys can be found 
just like I said before, out of the 254 counties that make up this state, 99% of those counties have populations of feral pigs. Now our population has dropped dramatically. And I can't help but feel my hypothesis about that is, we do know that there are a lot of hunters around that have been hunting from helicopters. In fact, a famous, famous hunter by the name of Ted Nugent did a documentary around here about, oh, maybe four or five years ago where he was hunting from a helicopter and he kind of knocked the population down. We used to see him or used to see evidence, quite a bit of evidence over in our preserve, the postal preserve. And here lately, we haven't been able to, I haven't been over to see if there's any uh, evidence, but I will tell you at one time, it was pretty common to see evidence or even maybe walk up on a feral pig or a hog. Now, are they dangerous? Well, they can be. To my understanding, if you walk up on a female that has babies, they, became, they can become very aggressive to protect those babies. And I've got a video that I'd like to share with you. So bear with me while I bring that video up. Uh oh. Oh, there he is. About eight years ago, we trapped a very large male in the postal here, uh, reserve. And this guy was so large, he was tearing the trap up. And you're gonna notice that there's gonna be food thrown to this guy. That was me throwing food to him. I didn't wanna get wet because this particular time of the year, we'd had a lot of rain. And this guy, he was traveling alone and he walked up in that trap. I guess he was hungry and we were able to trap him. So let's watch him, observe him for a minute. He's a very large fellow. He was really wreaking havoc with that trap, so I stayed back. I, we couldn't figure out what to do with him once we trapped him. Now he would have been dangerous. Basically, he probably would have used that uh, mode of fight or, I mean, flight or fight. And we know that flight means they will try to escape. But if they're backed up in a corner, they're going to fight. And this guy, they are very powerful. I was trying to toss the food over into the, the entrapment that he was in. We kind of estimated that he was pretty close to 500 pounds. And we had noticed that there was evidence that he had been walking along by himself. And I never considered or never thought that he would walk into a trap like this. Okay, I'm going to stop him and I'm going to stop sharing my screen with you and give you just a little bit more information about feral pigs. But listen, guys, they can be dangerous because they can become aggressive if backed in a corner or they feel like they can't escape or if they're protecting their young. Now, they do travel in family groups. Those groups can be all oh, 20, maybe 40, depending on the size. A group of feral pigs is called a sounder. Okay, now the reason I'm saying they can be dangerous, just recently a lady was killed outside of her house. And we don't know what the uh, details of why they attacked and why she was killed, but she did lose her life to those feral pigs. They can also spread diseases through parasites and pathogens. And because they have to wallow in mud, they can affect guess what? Our water system, because of carrying such diseases as one, uh, flu, foot and mouth disease, bubonic plague, and various intestinal worms. Hopefully I've given you uh, some information on what I consider to be one of the most unwanted animals that we have in our state, and that is the feral hog. 
I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Gorman in case some of you have any questions. I bet he can answer them for you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. What an industry program. And yes, we have a question. And one student wants to know, can we eat the feral hogs? Uh, yes, just like the domestic hogs, you can eat them. They taste a little bit different because their diet is a little different, but it's very good. Uh, just like the feral hogs, you don't want to eat a great big old large one like the one he had in that trap because uh, the meat doesn't taste too good, especially for a male at that point. And now Mr. Dominguez is going to give you an introduction of pythons in Florida. Hey guys, it's Mr. Dominguez, and today we've been talking about species that have become invasive to different environments and how they affect food chains and the organisms that are native to those environments. Here we have a red-eared slider, and red-eared sliders are in the top 100 most invasive species list, but they're actually native to this part of the world. But because they are so popular as pets, they are sometimes accidentally released and have become very prevalent in other parts of the world where they are not native. But today, we're actually going to talk about pythons and how they've become invasive in Florida. And that's because they are out competing the organisms that live there. So let's get started with this presentation. This is Pretzel. She is a ball python. She is very closely related to the Burmese python, the invasive species that we are going to focus on today. But I wanted to give you guys a closer look at a python that we have here at the Environmental Center. Ball pythons are native to Africa. They are constrictors, which means that they kill their prey by squeezing it. They are reptiles, and as we know, reptiles are cold-blooded or ectothermic organisms. That means that they rely on environmental heat to properly digest their food and control other bodily functions. Now, that's going to be really important to note because pythons, like pretzel here, require year-round heat. And what does Florida have year-round? They have pretty warm temperatures, just perfect for pythons to thrive in. So let's talk about the Burmese python next. The Burmese python, like the ball python, is a constrictor, so they have a very similar body structure. However, the Burmese python is one of the largest species of snake in the world. They can grow up to be 20 feet in length, unlike the ball python, which typically only reaches 6 to 7 feet in length. This size is one of the biggest reasons why the Burmese python has become so successful in the Florida Everglades. They are able to outcompete native predators like the alligator for food resources such as rabbit, possums, raccoons, birds, and even deer. Interestingly enough, the Burmese python is actually endangered in their native range of Southeast Asia, where they are hunted for their skins. All right, guys, I'm back inside because I wanted to talk to you guys about one of the reasons why species like the Burmese python become invasive in the first place. So last year, I purchased a Socata tortoise. Socata tortoises, or the African spurred tortoise, are native to Africa, and they are the third largest species of tortoise in the world. So I knew that when I purchased this little cute turtle, that I would eventually have to provide this ginormous tortoise with a proper environment, a proper habitat for it to thrive and be healthy in. So for now, he is currently in a tub where he gets all his light, heat, and food requirements. But I knew that he was a huge responsibility. Not all people think the same way I do. And sometimes owning a reptile or any other animal can become overwhelming and people will often release their pets into the wild. Burmese pythons, like Socata tortoises, are not native animals to the United States. However, they are very popular pets and are sometimes irresponsibly released into the wild when their owners can no longer provide all of, all the things that they need uh, for them to be happy and to thrive in. So they think that releasing them into the wild is a good idea. 
Now, this, of course, is not the responsible thing to do because if they do survive, if they do thrive and reproduce, they can eventually outcompete native species or decimate other species as a food resource uh, and completely destroy established food chains. Some animals have become extinct in this manner. So if you ever purchase a reptile or any other animal and can no longer care for it, the responsible thing to do is to surrender it to a shelter or to a rescue. This is the Florida wood stork, one of the species of birds that is unfortunately decreasing in numbers due to overpredation by the Burmese python. Where the Burmese python has very well established populations, you also see a decrease in the number of other common animals such as possums, raccoons, rats, and foxes. And while you may think, well, Mr. Dominguez, those are very common animals, what's the problem? Keep in mind that they are a food resource. Other animals rely on those animals as food. Some animals like the American alligator are also decreasing due to a lack of resources. And Burmese pythons have also been spotted hunting the small offspring of these alligators. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this portion of your virtual field trip. Here I have another non-native species. His name is Teddy. He is a redfoot tortoise. He is native to South America. But if I were to release him into the wild, something that I would never do, I don't think he'd survive for very long here in Texas. We just have too many temperature extremes, and he needs a very humid, very warm environment, which kind of makes me think that he would probably be able to survive in Florida just fine. So let's not release him into Florida. They already have plenty of problems with the Burmese python. All right, guys, I will see you guys next time. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. And we have a question. Uh, how large do pythons get? The Burmese python may reach a length of 26 feet and a weight of more than 200 pounds but the average size of the Burmese python in Florida is between eight to 10 feet. For some reason, they don't get near as big there. Okay, and now Ms. Ram is gonna tell you about the removal of the lionfish. Hey everybody, it's me, Ms. Ram, and today we are talking all about lionfish. So let me get my screen going. Okay, so of course we are talking about um, invasive species today. And the lionfish is a very inv invasive species um, that is reaching Texas um, as we speak. So by the end of my field trip, you'll be, or you'll be able to predict how the introduction and removal of an invasive species may alter the food chain and affect existing populations in the ecosystem. And of course, we are talking about the lionfish. So our essential questions are, what impact do lionfish have on a coral reef ecosystem? And how have people tried to remove lionfish um, from coral reef ecosystems? So first, let's meet the red lionfish. Now, lionfish are actually one of my favorite fish, even though they are invasive. Um, they're pretty cool. They're awesome expert hunters. They've got like a unique hunting style and they are awesome to watch and to look at. But that being said, when they are in habitats that are not native to them, they can be really destructive. So there are multiple kinds of lionfish and the most problematic is the red lionfish that you see here. They can get up to 14 inches long, so they are quite large, especially um, if you know anything about reef, um, fish, a lot of times they're quite small. So as you can imagine, the lionfish doesn't have very many predators. So let's look at the lionfish anatomy. So they are venomous. They have venomous spines, anterior dorsal venomous spines. Um, there's a non-venomous caudal fin, non-venomous dorsal fins, but they do have venomous anal spines and 
pelvic um, fins. So different parts of the lionfish are obviously venomous and other parts are non-venomous. And they contain um, a dangerous neurotoxin. So that kind of makes them hard. Um, they're not easy prey, right? So there's very few animals that can attack them and they can be dangerous to humans. And we'll talk about what happens if you get stung uh, by a lionfish and what you should do um, towards the end of my presentation. So the um, lionfish life cycle, like most fish, they lay a lot of lot of eggs. Um, during spawning events, they can lay 15,000 to 30,000 um, eggs in a spawning event. What makes these troublesome is they have spawning events up to uh, every four days. So if a female is healthy, she'll have she'll spawn every four days, which is kind of problematic because that's how they spread so quickly, right? Now, of course, not all 30,000 of those eggs are gonna become fertilized and um, reach adulthood, but with that many eggs, um, you can see how it would be very easy for them to spread. Um, so an adult lionfish, I'm not gonna read all of these um, facts for you. You can look them up if you're interested, but um, an adult lionfish can live up to 15 years um, in their native environment. And that's with natural predators, um, so we're not sure how long they're living um, in the Atlantic when they're in their non-native habitats. But 15 years is a very long time, especially when you consider how large and how many um, smaller fish they're able to wipe out. So where are they? Um, so if you look at the blue and the green on our world map, that is where their native range is. So that's where they're normally found. Um, that's where they come from, right? Um, so mainly mainly the Caribbean islands um, and, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I had that on the bottom. They're from the Indo-Pacific. So they're in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Now where they're invasive, this is where Florida comes in. So you can see where they are invasive in red. So they are very prevalent in Florida. Like I said, they're now reaching um, on our end of the Gulf of Mexico, they're reaching Texas, not nearly as horribly as they are in Florida, but they are over here now. So you can see where they are invading. So my little facts at the bottom are, there are 4,700 plus reports of lionfish in their invasive range from South Florida to the Caribbean islands, um, and just 478 reports here in Texas. And this is from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. So you can see we have significantly less reports, but that is a good thing. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't pay attention because like I said, with the reproducing um, every four days, um, that small number could quickly grow into a large number. Um, and that's how they've spread so easily over in Florida. So how do they get here? Well, lionfish are common aquarium fish. Um, back in the eighties, there was a high demand for lionfish. And keeping an aquarium in itself is not dangerous. I do that as well. I used to have a lionfish actually, not a red lionfish um, when it was much smaller. But regardless, keeping them in an aquarium is not a problem. What becomes a problem is when you lease, release your aquarium fish or your pets into the environment because they're not from here, that's not going to be healthy. So never dump your aquarium, no matter what kind of fish it is, do not dump your fish because they can um, contribute to the invasive species population. So just like Mr. Dominguez was talking about with the pythons in Florida, um, releasing your pets is extremely dangerous and you should not do it. So if you get a pet, they are your responsibility for the entirety of their lifetime. So where do they live now? So they are from coral reef environments. So they live in reefs um, and they are kind of an apex predator in the reef system. Um, and if you look on the right, there's pictures of a lionfish that's inhabiting a oil rig. So here in Texas, they inhabit the oil rigs or reef systems, um, anywhere where they can kind of hide and pop out and hunt. Uh, so that is where they prefer to live. What do they eat? They will eat anything they put in they can fit in their mouth. So they're open, their mouths open super, super wide. They can eat 
really large fish and they can eat a lot. They eat a lot and a lot of fish and I'll get into that in just a second. So here's an example of a food web uh, with lionfish in it. Now lionfish can eat an average of 60,000 reef fish within the first two years alone. And you could see how problematic that would be. They can wipe out 90% of a reef ecosystem. So you can see in this uh, diagram of this food web, they are at the top. They are able to eat so many of these fish. So they compete with groupers and snap, uh, snappers because those fish are usually the larger fish and they depend on smaller fish to eat. But also the lionfish will eat their young. So that means less adults and less food competitors for the lionfish. So who eats lionfish? Um, <laughs> here is a shark <laughs> photoshopped eating a lionfish, but sharks are predators to lionfish. Um, so a lot of areas in Florida, they say don't feed the sharks because if the sharks are well-fed, they're not gonna go after um, other big fish like lionfish. So something to consider is not feeding sharks, let them hunt naturally how they should because it's really hard to remove um, the lionfish. So you can see a more complicated food web. They're not all labeled. The important factors are that the sharks and the lionfish are labeled. So before an invasion, you can see sharks are the only apex predator. They are at the top of the food web. Um, and you can see after, now they're competing with lionfish instead. So yes, sometimes they're eating the lionfish, but now, they're definitely um, in competition. So that is not good. So how can we remove lionfish? Well, really you kind of have to do it by hand. So at this point, the way they're removing lionfish is through scuba divers and spear fishing. So they're spear fishing literally one by one reef by reef. So that takes a very long time, especially if you see how many um, lionfish there actually are. And now um, different restaurants and stuff in Florida are serving them on their menus. So like I said earlier, snappers and groupers are uh, what competes for the food with the lionfish. And those are also common foods, uh, common fish in restaurants. So they're trying to replace those fish with lionfish because they taste very similar apparently. And that way, less uh, groupers and snappers are being hunted in the wild. So um, they are a food source, so that is one positive. All right, so I told you I was gonna tell you what to do if you get stung by a lionfish. So if you are ever stung by a lionfish, we know that they have um, venomous fins and spines, and those spines are laced with powerful neurotoxins. So they're not fatal, but they can be very, very, very painful and should be taken seriously. So if you're stung by a lionfish, um, this is once again, according to the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, you should immerse the wound in hot water um, for about 15 to 20 minutes, being careful not to burn the skin and seek medical attention immediately. So that's all I have for you today. Um, and I can't wait to see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ms. Schramm. And the question came in just then, uh, are lionfish poisonous? No, lionfish are venomous, which means they deliver their toxin through needles, namely their spines. Toxin from poisonous creatures, on the other hand, must be ingested to work. Without their spines, lionfish would have no way to inject the toxin. And now Ms. Ramirez is gonna tell you about species extinction. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez and we're gonna be learning about species extinction. Uh, before we get started though, I do want to introduce you guys uh, to one of our animal friends out here. Uh, this is WC the work cat. And the reason I am showing you guys this cat is because according to US Fish and Wildlife, uh, feral and domestic cats have contributed to the extinction of over 33 species worldwide. Uh, so I know we all here at work love WC the work cat. Um, I didn't want to bother him because if he awakes, he's going to be all over my desk. Um, but I found that super interesting that domestic and feral cats um, cause the extinction of a lot of animals simply because 
uh, they are huge uh, predators. So they prey a lot on the birds and the rodents, and plus they can transmit diseases. Uh, so I found that super interesting. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys and we'll get started on the actual presentation. I do have a couple of essential questions for y'all. So hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first is how might the extinction of one species in an ecosystem affect other species? And the second is what is a keystone species and how might their extinction affect others? And so what you're seeing here in the video, uh, this is my classroom and I think I have the best classroom, but in these on my wall, uh, these animals on my wall are all examples of endangered species. Now we have them on loan from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So no, we did not coach these animals, somebody else did, uh, but they got in a lot of trouble for it. So unfortunately these animals, someone illegally hunted and uh, killed them. Now, while these species represented on my wall are endangered, they're not extinct, um, but how do you think the ecosystem would be affected if they did go extinct? So we have that beautiful spotted cat, which is an ocelot. Of course, we see the polar bear. Uh, we have a special type of mountain zebra. We have the water buffalo horns. And then we also have uh, the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle shell. So again, all of those are endangered species, but how do you think uh, the ecosystem would be impacted if they were actually extinct and no longer with us? So that's what we're gonna be discussing today. So the first one that we wanna talk about is the ivory-billed woodpecker. And this one actually was declared extinct fairly recently back in September of last year. Um, and so the US Fish and Wildlife proposed removing the ivory bill woodpecker from the endangered species list and actually declaring it extinct. And this happened in September. And that is simply because the last confirmed sighting of this bird was back in 1944. And that was in Louisiana. Now there have been unconfirmed reports since then uh, but for the most part, uh, people think that those unconfirmed reports, they were actually seeing a pileated woodpecker, which looks very similar to this woodpecker here. And I thought it was interesting that people called this bird the Lord God bird because of what was said when they saw it. Uh, so it was said that as soon as people saw this bird, they would exclaim, Lord God, what a bird. And that is because this bird is truly magnificent. It's almost two feet tall and has a wingspan of about 30 inches. So this was a really big woodpecker. And unfortunately, um, it species declined due to habitat loss, especially here in East Texas, um, logging. So there was a lot of deforestation and that heavily impacted this particular species of woodpecker, particularly because they nest in the mature old growth forest. And some of the impacts of their population decline impacts other organisms. So the first thing is these guys ate fruit and by eating that fruit, they actually helped with seed dispersal. Secondly, these guys were predators of beetles. So they helped to keep insect populations in check. Thirdly, uh, they stripped bark from the trees and oftentimes they would strip that bark to get to the insects. Well, in the process of stripping the tree bark, it also allowed other insects and other birds to access that tree for food and shelter. So you can see that they have that really strong chiseled beak. And then fourth, and most importantly, these woodpeckers, uh, their abandoned nesting holes inside the trees were used by other birds and animals for shelter as well. Uh, so the impact of these guys going extinct, other animals are gonna be affected as well. And then most importantly, there is a loss in biodiversity. So biodiversity affects the health of an ecosystem. By removing a balance, you're Sorry, by removing a species, you're creating an imbalance in an ecosystem. So there's our uh, poor little ivory-billed woodpecker. And the next one, this one is not extinct, but it is an endangered species that we have here in Texas. This is the red wolf. And as of October of last year, there was less than 20 of them in the wild. So that's not very many. Um, however, there are over 200 that are in captivity under the species survival plan. And they once roamed parts of East and South Texas. So you can see their population where their population used to be. And some of the things that impacted these, of course, were habitat loss, competition with coyotes, the introduction of diseases, and something that I thought interesting was hybridization. So these guys actually can mate with coyotes and that affected the true genetic lines of the red wolf. Um, and if you live near Dallas, 
uh, Glen Rose, Texas, there is a uh, fossil rim park and they actually have an American red wolf and they are part of their breeding program. So that would be a fun little day trip for you guys to go visit fossil rim um, animal park. The next thing we're gonna talk about are specialist species. And these are unique species that require very specialized, unique resources. So often these species have a very limited diet or need a very specific habitat condition to survive. So for example, locally here in Texas, we have the monarch. Now, while the monarch is not endangered, their population numbers have declined significantly over the years. And uh, just last year, uh, there was a push to petition to have them on the candidate for the endangered species waiting list. Uh, so we'll just have to wait and see if that happens. Uh, but their population is declining due to habitat loss, pesticide use, and changing climates. Um, but what do you think would happen if their food source was no longer here? So because monarchs are a specialist species, their larvae only eat from uh, the milkweed plant. And so if there were no more milkweeds, how would that impact the monarch butterfly? It would be detrimental. We wouldn't have any more uh, monarchs. Uh, so specialist species are even more impacted by the loss of other species. And monarchs just in, are important in general because they're important pollinators and they're also prey species for a lot of our birds. Another example of a specialist species um, would be the Kincaid's lupine and the fender blue butterfly. Both of these are endangered. So these organisms are found only in Oregon. And the Kincaid's lupine is an endangered plant, but because this plant is endangered, it caused the fender blue butterfly to also become endangered because this butterfly is a specialist species and only feeds on the Kincaid's lupine. Um, so it's kind of like a domino effect. Organisms are intertwined, and if one organism uh, becomes extinct or endangered, others are going to be affected as well. And then we have other species called keystone species. And a keystone species is a species on which other species and an ecosystem largely depend on them, such that if it were removed, the ecosystem would change drastically. So a good example would be this cool looking cactus. It's a Sararo cactus, mostly found like in California and toward the West. But this is an important keystone species for the desert. They can live over 200 years. They provide food, water, and shelter for many desert animals. So the flowers provide nectar for bats, birds, and insects. The fruit uh, provides food, and it usually might be the only food source in the desert during the summertime. And the cactus also provides nesting spots for birds and bats. Um, and it's threatened due to an invasive species, the buffalo grass. Now, ironically, the buffalo grass was actually brought to the United States from Africa and it was introduced uh, so that livestock here could have forage. Um, but by introducing that buffalo grass so that our livestock could have food, it kind of grew out of control and it overwhelms uh, this type of cactus and it is really harmful to it. So that's another effect of bringing in those invasives. Um, but if this cactus were to go extinct, it would impact the birds, the bats, and other rodents that use this cactus for food sh and shelter and water. Now here locally in Texas, a good keystone species are the prairie dogs. Uh, so their burrows actually provide homes for many other animals like owls. Uh, because those prairie dogs dig their tunnels, it helps to mix the soil to churn nutrients. Um, and they're also a food source for lots of other animals like birds of prey, and also like the endangered black-footed ferret who also preys upon these animals. Uh, but most importantly, the digging that these animals do helps to aerate and fertilize the soil and allows other plant species to thrive in those conditions. Um, now their population is in decline due to diseases like plague, habitat loss, and just human intolerance. People don't really like prairie dogs, um, especially the farmers because they're huge tunnels create these deep holes in the ground that can be harmful to livestock. But by removing these prairie dogs, we're impacting all these other animals that you see here in this diagram. And then my little challenge for you guys is to research an extinct, endangered, or threatened plant or animal in your state. Uh, see if you can identify its scientific name, why it's declining, 
and see if you could figure out how its absence might affect the ecosystem. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share. And that is all I have for you guys today on extinction. We're gonna give it back to Dr. Worman to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Maris. As a student asked, would you just define extinction? The extinction of any species is an irreversible loss of part of the biological richness of the earth. Extinction can be a natural occurrence caused by an unpredictable catastrophe Chronic environmental stress or ecological interactions such as competition, disease, or predation. Thank you again. And we will share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students predicted how the introduction or removal of an invasive species may alter the food chain and affect existing populations in an ecosystem and predicted how species extension may alter the food chain and affect existing populations in an ecosystem. Mr. Monroe uh, introduced the feral hogs in Texas. Mr. Dominguez, pythons in Florida. Ms. Tram discussed lionfish and Mr. Ramirez, species extension. Thank you teachers, if you would, Go to www.tiny.cc slash HS feedback. Fill out a very short form and send it to us. We would appreciate your input on the program. Thank you again. Y'all have a great day and get ready for some bad weather tonight. I predict that it's going to get bad.